In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I'd like us to reflect this morning on a very big theme. Some people might think that such a theme is best left to professional theologians in the pages of a learned journal, but I don't think so. I hope you'll agree with me that the theme we're going to take is something that all Christians will probably have thought about at one time or another, and it's good to have these out in the open. I begin with a negative point. Some people suggest that after death there is a final judgment, but those who put their trust in Jesus Christ will be saved for an eternal life, but those who don't will spend the rest of their time in hell. In one form or another, all of us have probably heard that kind of understanding of a Christian story. Most modern people reject this on moral grounds, and surely they're right to do so. How could we possibly call God good, who created a world in which the vast majority of human beings who have ever lived will perish everlastingly? But there is another tradition based firmly in the New Testament, a minority tradition, but still there. Just listen to these few texts. In 1 Timothy we read, whose will it is that all should find salvation. And then in 2 Peter, it is not his will that any should be lost, but all should come to repentance. And then Colossians, for in him God in all his fullness chose to dwell, and through him to reconcile all things to himself. And then finally, some wonderful words of St. Paul in 1 Corinthians. God will be all in all. Now think through the implications of those amazing verses. Now, to these verses, some might reply, well, what about the teaching on judgment and hell, which is clearly there in the Bible? Isn't it sentimental to ignore this? What about all the terrible evil there is in the world? Surely can't ignore all this, and nor does he. But as Professor Jode used to say in the old Brains Trust, and there are one or two people here who perhaps remember that, it all depends what you mean by. It all depends what you mean by by hell. When I was Bishop of Oxford, I visited a therapeutic prison in which there were a number of prisoners who were there for murder. I had a session with a group of them, and almost all of them talked about the impossibility of being able to forgive themselves. The thought of what they'd done was something that they had to live with and they couldn't live with. Surely there's no greater hell than the searing consciousness of having done harm to other people. And scores of examples from novels and real life could be quoted to show this. Let me just give one from T.S. Eliot's poem, Little Gideon, in which he wrote about the gifts reserved for age. And last, the pending, and last, the rending pain of reenactment of all that you have done and been, the shame of things ill done and done to others harm, which once you took for exercise of virtue, then fool's approval stings and honour stays. So where is God in all this painful process of self-knowledge? Quite simply, God, the God who has revealed himself in Christ, is with us. God never gives up on us. And God will see us through whatever flames of self-knowledge we experience now or lie ahead. Later in the same poem, T.S. Eliot wrote, Who then devised this torment? Love. 
Love is the unfamiliar name behind the hands that wove the intolerable shirt of frame, which human power cannot remove. We only live, only suspire, consumed by either fire or fire. We only live, only suspire, consumed by either the fire of self-knowledge or the fire of God's love. And they are in the end both aspects of the one divine love, drawing us inexorably to himself. To put it in a nutshell, God, I believe, does not send us to hell, but we create our own hells, either here or in the hereafter. But God doesn't leave us there. In Christ, he is with us in whatever dark place we might find ourselves, leading us to our Heavenly Father. And I want to approach this from a very different point of view, that of the modern atheist. In the form of Ivan Karamazov's question in Dostoevsky's great novel, The Brothers Karamazov. Ivan recounts some stories of the most terrible cruelty to children and says, it's not I don't accept God, Alyosha, I just most respectfully return him his ticket. This is a challenge that never goes away, and time and again a believer will be brought up short. But we need to think through what it might actually mean to return the ticket and what the implication of this might be. For the clear implication, it seems to me, is that it would be better not to have been born, better for life not to have existed at all. The French writer Albert Camus wrote that there is but one truly serious philosophical question, and that is suicide. Judging whether life is or is not worth living amounts to the fundamental question of philosophy. Now it's desperately, desperately sad that too many people do in fact take their own lives. And yet the most, most vast majority of human beings do not. Is this because they feel, despite the terrible struggle and suffering in life, they feel that something very, very big, which they can't quite get hold of, is at stake? So that despite everything, they are able with the poet W.H. Orton to bless what there is for being, they are glad to have lived. If you are able to bless what there is for being, you are implicitly, implicitly, are you not, saying that it is good that the world exists. Now this does nothing, of course, for the millions who perished in misery and the scorch marks this leaves, leaves on our minds. And it leads to the other great problem of Ivan Karamazov's challenge that no possible future, no possible heaven, could possibly justify a world in which innocent children suffer. But again, I think we need to plot this and think it through. Suppose, for example, there is an ultimate state of affairs in which everyone who's ever lived is able to bless God for their being. An ultimate state in which the victim and the torturer are rarely able to embrace. An ultimate state in which the suffering, though not forgotten, has lost its sting, like two lovers who perhaps had a quarrel, who somehow forget that, or at least allow to drop out of sight in the joy of the re their reunion and love with one another. Now such a future hope, of course, is not a final knockdown answer to the terrible problem of suffering. But I believe without such some hope in the ultimate triumph of God's purpose of love for everyone, a belief in God has no moral standing. In other words, some, some such story is essential to Christian faith. God's loving, good purpose will prevail in the end. As St. Paul wrote, God will be all in all. Now, at this point, a very mischievous little thought might pop into the mind. If indeed all will be saved and live with God forever, why bother? Why bother to pray, to go to church, 
to take up the cross and follow Jesus. Of course, you no sooner said that, and of course, somehow it's revealed in its absurdity. Or perhaps what it reveals is that we've not yet come to love God and Christ for his own sake, for his inestimable love of us. The Christian life is not a life based on fear or reward. It is a life based on the fact that God is good, all good, supreme good, our true and everlasting God. And we know from our own experience to live in that everlasting good is to flourish and to fall away from it is to be diminished. So finally and very briefly I turn to the wonderful images in today's Gospel. First the parable of the sower. It's possible to tell this story, and the church has often told it, as a story of terrible waste. Most of the seed will be lost. But the thrust of it and the point of it comes at the end when we heard, and some of the seed fell on good ground, where it produced a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, and some thirtyfold. A wonderful image of abundance. And this is reinforced by two images a little further on in the chapter, where Jesus likens the kingdom of heaven to a mustard seed, smaller than all the seeds, yet grows, he said, into a great tree in which the birds of the air can root. Again, he said, it's like yeast which leavens the whole loaf. These are images of triumphant flourishing, of the glorious consummation of God's good purpose. And I believe that this message, that the God who is with us in Christ, is a God whose loving purpose includes everyone, and whose purpose will in the end, will prevail for all, is a message of great hope, one that builds confidence. It's a message that breaks down all the barriers between other people, whatever they might believe. It really is good news, which we would long for other people to hear and respond to. And meanwhile, we who seek to respond to it are those who open ourselves to be that good soul. We want to be those who hear the word and respond to it. We want to be that tiny seed which grows into a great tree. We want to be the yeast which will in the end make the whole loaf rise. And to that God who sows that seed in our hearts, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be all glory, now and forevermore. Amen. <coughs>